Hey guys, what's going on? It's Filmington back with another video. We are going to talk about car shows again, but this one's going to be a little bit different, a little bit more positive. We're going to talk about tips for setting up at a car show. I am by no means an expert. I've been doing this for four years, but I think I could provide some advice at a bare minimum to some people that are just starting out, some people that have been doing it for a few months or a few years. By the way, I wanted to provide some clarifications. So Friday's video, I wasn't really, it was supposed to be constructive. I don't think car shows are bad. I think they're great. I think they're awesome. And I don't think everybody should avoid being a dealer because I think a lot of people are doing it the right way. I think for a lot of people, it's an integral part of their business model. But from what I've seen, heard, and experienced, I think a lot of people are utilizing these shows the wrong way. They're not devoting enough time and energy and creativity to make these shows effective for them and or they don't go in with an open mind in that, hey, I can use this for buying in addition to selling. Given the environment where a lot of people are coming into shows selling cards and a lot of people are setting up at shows trying to sell cards. So just trying to spin that you know, in a constructive way, saying that maybe you should utilize this to buy. If everybody's selling, maybe you should take the other side and there'll be some sort of an advantage for you. So, all right. So again, some of these tips, they might not be great. It's just sort of stuff that I've uh, accumulated along the way. And I think there are 14 tips in total, 13 and a half tips. Um, don't have a drawstring today because I had to use that for a project. So don't, uh, don't be distracted by that. Um, first tip is identify your business model and plan. This doesn't mean you need to write a full length 10 page business plan, although it might help some of you to be honest. Um, there's different models for selling at shows. You can have a, what I like to call like a high volume wholesale or just like a high volume low end model where it works well if you're committing a lot of time to it because it requires a lot of buying and a lot of selling and you're turning over inventory. So the average amount of money that you'll make off each card and the average revenue off each card will be small, but over time, as that compounds, those revenues and that profit margin actually becomes quite impressive. So for this model, you know, I've seen people at shows that have been around the block, they've been setting up for 25 plus years, and it's taken them decades to build their networks because you kind of have to build your own supply chain. You know, who are you going to source that product from? Are you gonna be buying collections? Are you gonna be relying off two to 10 to 20 individuals you know, or are you gonna be on Facebook Marketplace? So it's not just old timers that are able to make this work because I know of somebody who's actually really close with me. He recently went full time, I think in 2020, and this is what he does. This is his model. Um, he does a lot of buying and selling, and it doesn't mean you, you, you're you doing it off of the internet. You could be using eBay, whatnot, Facebook, Twitter, Discords to do buying and selling, um, but you, you could use a show certainly to turn over a lot of these these cards. Um, the second business model is the mid to high end model, and that is the people with you know the two hundred to five hundred and up dollar slabs or raw cards that are in display cases, and as opposed to the first model where there's likely some value boxes involved, whether it be dime, quarter, dollar. $5, $10 prices marked value boxes. This is more of a display case oriented model. And that works for some people. Again, especially if you're trading this as a full-time thing. The third business model could be wax, selling retail wax. Um, a lot of people I know have retail hookups. Uh, there's a lot of people I know obviously that have the hobby hookups too that set up at shows and are able to use their table space there to try to move some wax. Then you've got supplies. So in, in a lot of shows, the smaller ones, there might be an exclusive person that sells supplies. He's worked out an arrangement with the promoter of the show to be the only person there that can sell supplies. With bigger shows, you've got Ultra Pro and some of the bigger vendors to compete with, um, but that is another model. So you can be a hybrid of many of these models, like. A and B or A and C, do a little bit of high volume, low end, as well as wax. But I haven't seen too many people succeed at close to a 50-50 split. So for somebody to be, you know, if they have two tables and have one be the high end stuff in display cases, and then to be also doing low end stuff with like the five, four or five uh, row boxes and value boxes and stuff like that, and to have 
you know, that supply chain built up to source that product and then to sell that product as well. I haven't seen too many people be successful at that, but that doesn't mean that you can do like a 90% 10 or an 85, 15. You probably do need to have one dominant business model though, based on what I've seen work. Um, and also, this is important to understand what your business model is at the get-go because it's difficult to pivot. You know, it, it's not so much difficult to pivot sports from like baseball to basketball, assuming that you have the knowledge of the players and of the hobby itself, uh, which which could be different. It's You're dealing with different brands. But I would argue that it's even more difficult to pivot from a selling perspective from a high-volume, low-end person to a supplies or to a mid to high end display case oriented model. I think it's uh, it takes some time and it'll take a few months at a minimum in order to to kind of figure out what you need to do to make that work and to completely switch models. All right. Tip number two is show up early. OK, I wish I would follow this one better myself. <laughs> Sometimes I just like to sleep in on a Saturday, but show up at least an hour early, maybe two find out what time the doors open. Usually they'll open at least an hour and a half ahead of time. There'll be people that will be traveling from farther away uh, than you that will, it'll take them an hour to set up if they've got three tables and if, especially if they're doing that kind of low end model. Um, so figure out when the doors open because in any given show, tw- probably around like 25 to 75% of your sales will be dealer to dealer. Meaning that that first hour or two hours before the show officially opens, might be your busiest. So it might be your time to, to make some deals, not just sell stuff, but buy stuff as well. If this is your first time setting up at a show at this venue, expect to be popular. And within those first two or three hours, there's gonna be a lot of dealer to dealer sales. Everybody's gonna be curious about what the new guy has. And uh, it's just fresh inventory too. A lot of people don't turn over their inventory all too quickly. Uh, part of my criticism for Uh, That was in the previous video for some of the people that maybe aren't utilizing card shows the right way. But, you know, you're the new person. You've got completely fresh inventory, at least for that first time. For the first few times, maybe expect to be busy, expect to be making deals. Okay, number three is be prepared and price as much of your inventory as possible in advance. So there's different thought process here. There's some people that say, well, don't price it because you might lose leverage. And if somebody's interested, they'll ask. Um, A lot of people might try to use your prices and use those to kind of benefit them and maybe mark their inventory, adjust it accordingly. Uh, I wouldn't overthink it. I think it's as simple as if I'm a customer and you might be busy or maybe I just don't want to have a conversation with you. If you don't have prices on your cards, um, I might be a little turned off. I might be like, oh, What's up with this guy? Is he not prepared? Does he not want to make a sale? Is he going to have to use card ladder on the fly to verify all these like comps, recent comps for all these cards? Is this going to be like a complicated math equation for this guy to give me a price? And what if I'm interested in three cards? This is going to be a mess. I only have limited time here, especially at the national or at a show that doesn't have great Wi-Fi. Like, come on. Uh, you've got to price your inventory for small slash weekly or monthly shows. I would advise pricing stuff up to 2500 bucks. Over that, it's up to you, Uh, just my opinion. For bigger quarterly shows, maybe semi-annual or annual shows, I would price stuff up to 5,000 to 7,500 bucks. If you have something that's very rare and it truly hasn't sold in a while, you know, maybe maybe don't price it. Maybe don't seed your leverage there. And and that can be more of a conversation, but you're still benefiting the customer by pricing out 90 to 95% of your inventory. All right, number four is be prepared to buy. That means bring cash to the show. Well, you're gonna need to bring cash because you need to you know, do the whole change thing with customers. I'd recommend going to the bank that week and getting at least $300 in just like ones, fives, tens, and twenties, various denominations. You're probably gonna have some unprepared dealer next to you asking you for change. So that's gonna get rid of half your supply right there and you'll need, you'll need the rest just for change. But in addition to that, Bring a bunch of hundreds with you. Be ready to buy. Try, if you can, to make some sales leading up to the day of the show so you can have some cash flow. You can be cash flow positive uh, for that show. So customers are going to approach you. Be relaxed, but don't flinch. So take your time, right? They're going to come up to you and they're going to be interested and you don't have to give them an answer or a number within the first 10 seconds. 
You can think about it. You can take out your calculator. I'm pretty good at math, but I tend to make mistakes when I'm being rushed. So also be wary of sort of like mathematical games they can play with you. Like, well, if I take out this and that, or this is 80% of eBay and that, well, I want my numbers 0.7, like slow it down, take a breath, catch a breath and slow it down. But also again, don't flinch because if they stop by and they have something really special where you could maybe get a deal of a lifetime, then execute because once they walk away from your booth, they're not going to come back. Always offer though, to see what they have. If you have time, if there's a ton of customers over your table, maybe you won't have time to do that. But if you're able to give them one-on-one -on -one time, offer to see what they have. Maybe they're interested in something you have already, you know? So maybe it's not as simple as, Hey, will you buy all these cards? That I don't want anymore. Maybe it's like, well, I really want that card in your display case. You have to have a conversation with them. It's sort of like being a, um, a salesman at a car dealership. You can't pre-assume how much money somebody has or what their attentions are until you talk to them for a little bit. Be selective though. Okay. Given the current environment, don't feel like you need to buy everything. Probably going to get a lot of offers for different stuff that people have during that show. Don't be afraid to say no. If you suspect that this person might not be rational, maybe they're going to be so far away from you on price, given what they start out with. Well, I'm looking for this, but, um, don't be afraid to say, you know what? I'm not interested. Have a good day. Um, don't be afraid to make judgment calls based on what you're learning about this person as he's showing you cards and kind of giving you prices and you're learning more and more about kind of his perspective, but also don't be afraid to make an offer. So some people go to shows with maybe one or two cars in their pocket and they've already predetermined that they're going to take the highest offer from all of the dealers that they talk to at that show for that card or for those cards. So you don't know somebody's situation, you know? You you might offer 600 bucks for something that they want 2000 for, and they might come back to you afterwards and be like, you know what, this is the highest. I think it's probably fair. I'll sell it to you. Um, I didn't have any intention of walking away from this show with this card still in my pocket. I needed the cash. So, you know, I, I remember there was a case where there's a 2001 Retrofractor Pujols, not the card from Chrome Traded, the one that's more like gold that probably comes from, I don't know, Series 2. Anyways, there's somebody that had that, an authentic label from SGC crease right down the middle. And, uh, he wanted 2000 and you know, my first instinct was like, I no man, I don't think it's going to work. I just, I don't really see comps for this. I, there's been PSA eights that sell for around that in the past, but I'm pretty sure somebody at the show bought that card for like 600 bucks. If I'd known he would have accepted 600, I might've given him an offer. You know, sometimes you just can't be afraid to hurt people's feelings. Again, it kind of goes off judgment. You don't want to get the guy shouting at you. You don't want to get him mad. I guess there's tactic delivering information in a mature, professional, and courteous way. And then also part of this is you want to be buying from other dealers, especially in today's environment. So take advantage of those that have had a bad show. They might be more willing to work with you. There's going to be a number of people at shows between now and the end of this year, maybe going into next year, where they're going to be cash flow negative, or they're going to be, you know, maybe they made three to 500 bucks from the show. Again, it kind of depends on the show. The number of sellers right now outnumber the number of buyers. So use that to your advantage. And when you do buy from other dealers, again, be selective, but ask for cash discounts. Say you're going to pay in cash. Hopefully you brought the cash. If you listen to, uh, if you listen to the first part about this tip, which was to bring cash. Number five is know your goals heading into the show. So you might have a profit goal, but I think it's also important to have a cash flow goal. And this also depends on which model you have, the high volume low end model or the mid to high end model. The, the high volume low end model might be more suitable for the, uh, the cash flow and getting a predictable amount that's kind of consistent from one show to the next. So, you know, based on that model, you know, what's your goal for this show coming up? How much money do you want to make and how much profit do you want to make? And that'll be important right before you finalize each transaction. How is that going to play towards your overall goal? It's okay to meet your profit goal, but not meet your cash flow goal or vice versa. You're not going to be able to knock it out of the park all the time, especially if you have a display case model. So just kind of, kind of know that. Um, have your goals in the back of your head, and hopefully that will prevent you from making any suboptimal decisions.
Number six is understand the difference between cash value and trade value. There's going to be some customers that go to your booth and they are going to negotiate down the price of a card that you have. They're going to say, okay, well, you know, my number is this. Would you be able to meet me here? And then you might be like, well, I'll do 325. And they're like, okay. So to you, you've decided on a price, but then they'll say, they'll drop this on you. Would you accept trade or partial trade? So in that case, you have to understand the difference between cash value and trade value. You're no longer going to get $325 worth of cash. You're going to get that in cards. And if they're going to be using eBay comps to kind of come up with that $325 valuation for the trade or, you know, a component of that as partial trade, understand that the value of cash is higher and understand that you'll need to be a little bit more stubborn. You'll need to knock them down a bit on that trade value. Maybe you'll ask for 20% more from the trade perspective uh, versus the, the cash component. 20% more, maybe 25% more. This also depends on how much you want these cards and how easy it is to sell those cards. You're gonna have to think like, okay, if I'm gonna take on these one, this one card or these four or five cards, how much effort is it gonna take to sell these things? When will I be able to sell these things, right? What's the opportunity cost of that capital being tied up and how much will I be able to get for those cards once I can inevitably sell them? And you might not be able to predict all this, but you can kind of build in like buffers like, well, I could probably sell it for 45 plus or minus 20 bucks. Here also, guys, you need to develop an eye for grading. If you don't, if you don't buy raw to grade, you really should get into that unless you have really poor eyesight. <laughs> So this is where, and I hate to use generalizations, but most of the old timers in the show business, they don't have great eyesight. And for that, they don't buy raw to grade. Either that or they're really risk averse. They don't think the proposition's worth it. Um, maybe they have young people that are in their business that do that. They, that's what they should do. They should rely on people like that to kind of give that appraisal before that buying decision's made for that card and the price is given for how much they're willing to pay. But this is an area where you can certainly exploit. We've got grading costs coming down. I think PSA will be back down to maybe 12 bucks on bulk with uh, December approaching. Prices are coming down. They're not stagnating. They're not going up for the foreseeable future, guys. So take advantage of that. And uh, that can be one of the biggest ways you can make margin on a, on a trade or on a purchase from a dealer, from a customer at this point in time. Number seven is adjust and adapt. So, okay. Maybe you've had a chance to sniff out the show before you set up for the first time. Maybe this is a brand new show, so you're not able to do that. But look at what everybody else has. You're going to have to do a walk around during your first show just to see what everybody else has. If not, uh, try to buy some stuff that they have as well. Um, and if everybody has F1, if everybody has baseball, Bowman Chrome stuff, if everybody has vintage baseball or vintage football, you want to bring something that people don't have. You want to bring something that is also in demand. So that's what's meant by adapt. So adjust based on the supply, meaning focus on what people at the show don't have and adapt to the demand. Bring what's hot. So if everybody brings football and there's enough demand for football because of seasonality, because you're two, one to two months before the season begins, then yes, bring football. Um, also bring hot players. So back to adapt to demand, bringing what's hot, focus on hot players, focus on hot sports, hot markets, but also you don't want to bring out everything that everybody else has because not only will it be tougher to sell that stuff, but it'll be tougher to get the price you want because there'll be somebody that's going to be 5% underneath you. Most likely if there are three people in the room with the same card guys, number eight is self promote and cross promote. So you're in person. You've got your own real estate at a show. You have to take advantage of that. Hopefully you've got some sort of other revenue streams or other kind of angles to your business, other handles. Maybe you've got a social media presence. Hopefully you do at this point in time. So this is where you would throw all of that out there. You know, I didn't make a deal with this guy, but I walked by his table and I saw that he also sells the rookie card explosion box. He's on loop selling at 9 p.m. on Sunday nights. He has an eBay store with over 400 followers and 100% positive feedback. Whatever it is may be, you know, throw it all out there, guys. And a lot of people now, they're using the banners that are like the stand-up banners. Those are better for eye level to see that versus like a tablecloth. I have a tablecloth because I'm cheap. 
Uh, but you know, business cards, people still have business cards, um, stickers, advertise your brand. Hopefully you've already established a brand. Do I need to make a video about establishing a sports card brand? If you're going to be a dealer, uh, that's, that's kind of important guys. Make sure that people remember you and your other business lines or your other aspects of uh, the business that you run. Number nine is presentation is key. So maybe this is a little too right brain for me. I haven't quite perfected this one, but there's people at the show that definitely do this a lot better than I. Um, what I've done is with my display cases, you got to make sure that people can see the cards. You got to make sure that they're laid out in a way that's easy for them in an organized fashion by sport, by vintage, by slab versus raw or grading company, uh, overlap them in a way that looks inviting. And sometimes it's okay to kind of leave a little bit of extra real estate that's unused in your display case so people can more easily find the stuff that you want to lead them towards. So this goes down into like, do you want to put like the cards that you want to sell the most in the middle or do you want to put them at, in the edges of your display cases? Well, probably somewhere close to the middle. You want to put them at the top or do you want to put them at the bottom? Maybe you put the higher end stuff at the top. You know, it's really up to you. I can't really offer too many best practices on how to make your cards look nice but use different colors, use construction paper. I have terrible handwriting. I should be using my wife's. A clean, creative, and inviting presentation goes a long way. This next one is build relationships. So if you didn't have a great show from a, a monetary perspective, you didn't really sell a whole lot, maybe at least you met a few new people that really, you know, they could become potential customers or maybe they can help you track down a card or a hobby box that you haven't been able to find. And that can be very powerful in itself. It's hard to put dollar value on that, but it's very important nowadays when you're selling through multiple platforms, physical, as well as all the different online marketplaces where a lot of people don't just sell exclusively through like a MySlabs or eBay. Usually they're using multiple platforms. Um, it's important. It's important to expand that brand footprint and building relationships at a show can help you do that. We talked about self-promoting and cross-promoting earlier. Now, this is uh, there's a reputational thing here too, where we're a little bit different from the 90s in that the internet is forever now. So if you make a mistake, you really screw somebody over, take advantage of someone, rob someone, everybody's gonna find out about that. The hobby is relatively small and there are multiple forums Facebook scammers page run by scammers, blowout forums, where you can be outed for that. And the opposite holds true if you're a guy that goes above and beyond. You're known to be authentic. You're known to be somebody who's personable, right? So it's important to kind of build those relationships in person. It's stuff that you can't do on any Discord or chat or sort of DM system. You just can't build that type of intimacy with someone. So Build relationships and think about customer lifetime value. This is something that Apple has mastered, you know, and this kind of goes hand in hand with number 11, which is give people deals. But somebody stops by and you have a feeling you haven't made a deal with them yet, but you have a feeling that they could be a very good customer for you. So think about what it is they could provide for you over the course of the next 12 shows, over the course of the next two or three years, right? So don't be afraid to give somebody a good deal if you feel like they could be a return customer and that could provide a lot of value to your, your brand, your business. So again, number 11 is give people deals. Basically, there's three different types of money for the purposes of sports cards and hobby transactions. There is paying in physical cash, which is the best. There is paying through the non-1099 platforms, which are constantly shrinking, right? <laughs> but uh, Cash App, Zelle, uh, PayPal friends and family, which I can't even take anymore based on a July 28th rule change. Um, those types of, of platforms. And, uh, and then there's also like the PayPal goods and services where it's captured in a 1099. So this is something where you'll want to talk to your accountant about. But the key thing here is that the economic benefit from you taking the same amount of money through each of those three manners is going to be very different. What ends up in your pocket after May of the following year, but could potentially be different based on how you take in that money. So talk to your accountant about that. I am not a tax advisor. I am not giving you any advice right now. Give people deals if they're willing to buy in bulk. This is where you have to understand the cost that's associated with maintaining your inventory. 
there's a cost associated with monitoring it and managing it when there's price changes and also eventually selling it, monetizing your inventory in those specific cards. So understand that. That could be a reason why it might make sense to take 70% of market value if the guy's willing to take on all of these cards. And maybe there's a lot of low value cards mixed in, right? Um, understand the value of a bulk deal. Understand that time is money, especially if you're able to replace that inventory easily. Number 12, kind of cover this a little bit, but extract value from every show. Walk around, try to see if you can buy something. You know, if you're not having a busy day from a selling perspective, it's a slow day. Maybe you still picked up a $400 card for 250 bucks, or maybe you picked up a $1,500 lot for say like 950. And that in itself, that's a value. Talk to people, let people know what types of cards you're interested in. You know, what are you looking for? Or maybe let them know what you're interested in. Use this time to talk to other dealers to understand more about the hobby, the market, what players are hot. I know there's a soccer guy that I talk to a lot and I ask him about checklists and what he thinks about the long-term outlook of certain things. You know, some of these dealers might not be the same people you listen to that create content. They might not be super articulate. They might not have a fancy microphone, but they are very knowledgeable. They're very much in touch with the pulse of the market itself. So talk to them and learn from them. Number 13, this is a small one, but make sure to track and document your sales that occur at a show. A lot of people have Excel workbooks where they track their kind of hobby transactions, whether you do this part-time or full-time. There's probably a little bit of reliance on Excel, if not some other software program. And what I actually do is, yes, I have tabs for each of the different sports. And there's columns for like, the, the card, the year of the card, when I bought it, when I sold it, how much I sold it for, the fees, and also the ultimate like net profit. And there's a bunch of other columns as well. But I would advise to have a separate tab for show transactions. So that way, on like a row by row basis, you can track your revenues um, and, and what you actually sold, the cards you actually sold at each show. That will allow you to assess your performance over time, you know, and maybe you can use that to make some changes. Okay, well, this is going well, this is not. Also, if you do a lot of like bulk sales, you're not gonna be able to kind of itemize what you sold. Um, so, you know, you'll have to think about how you manage that from like a IRS tax reporting perspective. But if you have at least like a column for unaccounted for sales and you've got like just a, a number that, represents all of the bulk sales you did that day. That's just a number you might wanna have. And number 14 is don't get robbed. Oh, and uh, we didn't really get into like the pricing strategy, but if you're listing stuff at 5% to 20% above eBay, uh, I mean, that's up to you, but you know, you gotta ask yourself, is it better to have sold and lost or to have never sold at all. Was I completely off here? Anybody that's been doing this for longer than four years, um, I'm curious to understand your thoughts. Any other tips that you uh, you might think would be helpful for somebody who's just starting out? Uh, like, comment, subscribe, Filmington out. Thanks, guys.